Hi, this is Frank Hafner, uh, Orthopedic Residency Director at Professional Physical Therapy, and I am here with Rob Panarello, who is our Chief Clinical Officer. Today, we're just going to give talk to you guys about returning to sports and activity uh, post-COVID. You know, whether you're a professional athlete or a weekend warrior or, you know, the high school athletes going back. You know, uh, a lot of us, you know, haven't really regularly been participating in our sports, uh, and there could be some increased risk of injury with, with going back uh, without proper training and conditioning. So we're just going to have a little discussion about that. Uh, welcome, Rob. How are you doing? Good, Frank. How are you? Thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Yeah, I'm doing good. Uh, you know, looking forward to things opening up. Our athletes will be kind of getting back to their sports, which is exciting, but also, you know, could, you know, if they've been on, uh, you know, the couch and they're going right back to the court, that could certainly uh, cause some injuries. So, you know, what are your thoughts on this subject? You know, what do you think our, our athletes need to do? You know, whether you're a, a high level college or professional athlete, or even, you know, a high school athlete. I think that, um, regardless of what level you're at, it comes down to, there's always something you can do, right? It just comes down to the environment you're in. There may be some professional athletes that actually have a, a full gym in their homes and they can train. Uh, you may be a high school athlete that, you know, generally went to a performance center or a health club and now you're confined to your home. But I think there are always things that you can do. And the more you do in preparation for this return, uh, the better off you're going to be. I think the two things you really have to focus on is work capacity or the ability to, you know, perform activities uh, repetitively over time and have full recovery, whether that's, you know, individual repetitions on the field of play in practice or between practice sessions themselves or, you know, between exercises in a workout. But you, you have to develop a work capacity so that you can have recovery. And then you need to develop some kind of levels of strength because strength is the foundation for where all other physical qualities evolve, whether it's power, uh, elastic abilities, or speed. And I think these high school kids at home, you know, they're, they're probably, they're the greatest volume, right? There's probably more high schools and more high school athletes in the country than colleges, college athletes, and pro teams and pro athletes. You know, they could, they could always do body weight activities. So they could do body weight squats and push-ups and things of that sort. They can work on explosiveness by uh, jumping up uh, multiple steps in a single effort on a staircase, preferably a wooden staircase that gives versus a cement staircase. If they want to enhance their elastic abilities, they could jump up multiple levels of steps. And the reason why I like steps is the landing surface is obviously higher than the takeoff surface, so impact forces are less. And then something everyone could always do is sprint, right? Whether you sprint in your backyard or you sprint in the street or you sprint in a parking lot, you know, sprinting is a high level, the purest plyometric activity. It uh, requires strength and all the other physical qualities and includes velocity. And obviously you can program that to enhance um, you know, your work capacity by work rest recovery. It's the only thing I caution if you run on asphalt or in parking lots is that that's not a forgiving surface. So you have to be cautious with the volume of sprinting and, and also speed and, and tempo of sprinting as well. So if you have medicine balls, you could do medicine ball tempo, things like that. So I think there are always things you could do based on the limitations of the environment you're confined to. Great. Now, there is that, you know, evidence out there and actually this article on increased injury rates following the NFL lockdown, actually, uh, JOSPT, uh, this is uh, an article from 2011, but I just saw on uh, social media, they post this with the question, you know, could not, can the, the lockout be compared to the lockdown, um, which, you know, I thought was kind of an interesting tagline. Because here, you know, following that NFL lockout when they weren't practicing and regularly training and then went back to the season, there was an increased injury rate uh, relating to uh, Achilles rushers. So I, I think there is, you know, some concern here with these athletes uh, going back. 
and these are the guys at the highest level. Um, so I would assume that you know those participating at the you know the high school and college level and the, the weekend warriors that uh, aren't in uh, the best of shape, kind of going back to some of these sports. You know, we could see some more injuries out there. Would, would you agree? Not agree? Yeah, I think that. Well, first of all, as I just stated, you know, the best thing you could do is try to do whatever you can so that when you return to practice at whatever level you're in the best shape you can possibly be in based on the restrictions of the, the environment, right? And so that's one. And then you're gonna to have to deal with different things depending on different levels. So for instance, let's say you return to sport and you're at the high school level and you're a ninth grade you know, football player. And he says, I'm not gonna go into the huddle because my mom told me I have to keep a six feet distance from everybody based on the CDC, you know, what are you going to do? Um, you know, we're at the professional level, they're adult grown men and they'll take the, the risks and precautions as an adult would, you know, based on their own decision-making. You have to deal with those types of things at the college settings. Um, you know, if someone, how are you going to test, you know, and can you afford to test? Is testing available? Um, you know, if someone does come down with COVID-19, are you going to have uh, COVID dorms? Or is everybody going to be allowed to stay in their own dorm and just be restricted to their own dorm? Uh, you know, these are all the things that they have to work out. But with regards to return to play, I think that well, one thing you can do is I think you have to look, every all the head coaches, regardless of the level, are going to say, we've lost all this time. And so, you know, they may be of the mindset, and I use the word maybe, of the mindset that we have to make up for lost time. And so it's going to be as hard as we can go, as long as we can go. And that's where you're going to have breakdowns. And there's got to be an adjustment, in my opinion, in the practice schedules, depending on the condition of the athletes coming back. So at the pro level, if everybody had gyms and did their programs at their home and sprinted and running, maybe practice can be as usual. Um, at the high school level, where all kids probably didn't have a gym in their home and didn't have access to a, a gym, a performance center, or a health club, you're going to have to break things down. You may say, look, for the first week, we have three weeks of practice before we're going to really start playing games, or four weeks of practice before we start playing games. The first week may be, 60% sport practice, and then the other 40% for conditioning. And then this, the next week may be 70% for skill practice and 30% for conditioning, and then 80, 20, and then eventually 90, 10, so that there's a progression for the sport, sport practice and it, um, as athletes get in better shape, a reduction in their conditioning. And what that does is two things. It'll, it'll have the athletes become in better shape right, over a course of time. And it'll also limit the exposure of high intensity practice to the athlete that may suscept them over time to injury. I think that you can provide maximum efforts in practice, right? I think, hey, we're gonna go really hard on this play or we're gonna do a number of sprints really hard. I think it's the volume that has to be restricted um, because you can't go as hard as you can as long as you can because people, people will break down. And if someone gets hurt, you know, there's a hesitation to look at it at that capacity saying, well, look, if I only practice at 60% and then 70% and 80% in progressive weeks, I'm limiting my, my team too much. We'll never get all our work done. Well, you're not going to have an athlete at all. You're going to have them 0% if they're hurt on the sideline. So I think there has to be some type of progression and incorporation of skill practice with conditioning when these athletes return. And that progression is going to be based on the shape and the condition of the athletes via some type of initial testing when they do return. And then you'll, you'll figure it out from there. Great. Uh, the next study I pulled up was, uh, was published last year and it was just looking at runners. So maybe we're getting away from the I think this article kind of applies to, you know, the weekend warriors or, or the people just training. You know, I see, uh, I mean, certainly there are a lot of people out, outside exercising now. Um, 
but I'm sure a good amount of people have kind of been uh, fearful maybe to be outside running or doing whatever activities they were doing. Um, so this study showed that, you know, in, in people training for a half, half marathon, uh, those that kind of increase their weekly uh, mileage or distance greater than 20%, so at a significantly more injuries. So kind of going back to what you were saying about progression, and these are things you've you know, certainly taught me over the years, and it's a word that I always kind of bring up when I'm uh, speaking and teaching about you know, having a logical kind of stepwise progression to things that you know, just, you know, it just makes sense when we're training. We're not gonna make these big jumps. So I'm not really surprised at the results of this. Uh, I think making you know, 10% or 5% or 10% kind of jumps in the intensity or distance is kind of typically makes sense. And, you know, we can apply this whether we're rehabbing patients or, you know, if you're just talking about strength and conditioning training. So um, what are your thoughts about, uh, you know, the people just looking to exercise and, and get back out there? You know, I'm sure people are going to be excited and going to want to run out there and, and make up for lost time, just like you were mentioning. So what are your thoughts on, on those folks getting back out there? Yeah, I mean, just in regards to this study, I just think that, you know, it's too much of a added volume of work, you know, based on the physical abilities of the body, A, and the recovery of the body. So again, we spoke about briefly about work capacity. So I go out, you, you wouldn't train for a marathon, or well, in this case, you wouldn't train for a half marathon by running a half marathon every day, right? Because you'd break down. You, you just, your body wouldn't be able to tolerate it because you probably don't have the work capacity and the strength levels and other physical quality levels to sustain running a half marathon every day, right? If you're gonna train for a half marathon or a marathon. And then the second thing is you, you're draining the fuel tank, so to speak, so much that in your next training session, the fuel tank's not full. You haven't recovered. So you're always starting at a lower capacity and the combination of the lack of physical qualities and to sustain that, as well as the lack of a, of a, um, a capacity, a physical capacity, a work capacity, in combination, you're going, you're going down a dangerous road. You're going to break down. So I, I just think I agree with you. I think if you're going to increase volumes weekly, they have to be more prudent, right? Maybe 5% a week or whatever it may be. And, and I don't train marathon runners or half marathon runners, nor do I run them. So I'm giving you a, a philosophical perspective as I would with training athletes or training team athletes. Um, so, you know, that's one. And then the other thing is there's two ways to improve, right? You can enhance work capacities or physical qualities, whatever. And the other way you improve is, is through variation of training. And so, you know, maybe you run hard one day and if you have access to it, you use the elliptical in your house the other day so that you work some type of work capacity and, and VO2 max, but you know, you didn't have the pounding on your extremities. Or like I said, if you have a medicine ball, you can do medicine ball tempo or, you know, calisthenics or some type of variety than just running every day daily. You need, you need to have this variety of, of um, a variation of training which will help with recovery as well as adapt to uh, the adaption to different activities will make you a better athlete overall. So probably an increased distance of 20% per week, you know, is probably a little too much. And, and, and the justification of that statement is evident in the study saying, you know, people who did this got injured. So that's what I think you would need to do. In my, in my experiences, um, though volume and intensity go hand in hand, and intensity meaning the amount of weight lifted or the, or the, the velocity of, of the run or the distance added to the runs, right? The, the adaption for the body has to have an unaccustomed stress. That's why they'll adapt. They're not used to something and they adapt to the new stress that's applied. It's volume that usually winds up in injuring you versus intensity, right? If you had somebody run five sprints at 100%, they're going to be okay. But if they run 100, 100 sprints at 100%, they're probably going to get hurt. If someone tries to lift 
a weight once, a maximum effort once, they're probably not going to get hurt. They try to lift the maximum weight multiple times, eventually they'll break down. And so it's usually the volume versus the intensity that, uh, that results in the overuse type injuries we see, strains, sprains, et cetera. I would, uh, you know, I, I definitely agree. And, you know, these are you know, things you were mentioning about the cross training um, and, and all of the different advice that, you know, we always kind of come and talk about it and discuss it with our patients and athletes. But I think sometimes there's still, you know, you have people that just love to run and that's all they do. Um, so I think it's still important to continue to talk about this, get them to try to do different activities because that's what it applies different types of stress and levels of stress and overall, uh, you know, have more success. I'm, I'm sure, you know, with running, I'm sure if you talk to the elite level uh, runners or Olympic level, uh, I'm sure they include some cross training. That's why they have such great results. And, and vary your distances, right? If you have a long run one day at a, at a um, pre fairly pre good pace, for lack of a better term, then have a shorter shorter run at maybe a, a more easy recovery pace the next day, and then maybe have a sprint day of short distances. And it's not more is what's better. It's it's the ability to vary your training so that you're always able to recover and be fresh so that you can adapt to that next day that's the most stressful in your training regimen. Can't do the same high level of stress day in, day out. That's what's going to cause you to break down due to the inability of the, of the athlete to adapt to those stresses, as well as the inability to recover fully in preparation for that type of training. Great. And, and lastly, uh, and you know, we've both been touching on it uh, as we've been uh, talking here, and we kind of always kind of circle back to uh, Vermeil's pyramid uh, and work capacity. And you know, I always like, uh, like this because it kind of really that what we were talking about as far as progression yeah. um, and you got to do a and b before you do c um you know this this chart really lays it out like that you know with you know having that work capacity and that you know base level of of strength and conditioning to go on to then do you know higher higher levels of activity and, and plyometric type training so this is that uh, Albert Neal's pyramid, and then the one you assisted him in developing more for the, the rehabilitation. But again, I'll always remember you talking about power and how strength is a component of power. And if you don't have the adequate levels of strength, you can't produce you know, uh, power or force quickly. Um, so that you gotta do things in that you know, stepwise regression. Uh, you have any comments on, on the pyramid? Yeah, I mean, if you look at the the pyramid to the left of the red triangle, I mean, you know, we do an evaluation and a testing when we train an athlete. This is Albert Meal, is a Hall of Fame strength coach and a good friend. And then, you know, we've covered work capacity, the ability to perform optimally repetitively over time and workouts over time. And then, you know, if you think of the physical quality of strength, well, let me back up the there's different physical qualities. It's not just about being strong. And so if you look at the physical quality of strength, well, if we define strength as the ability to produce force and explosive strength, power, the, the component where now there's a velocity aspect to it, right? Strength plus speed. Well, if you can't produce force, how are you gonna produce force quickly? And so the, what's important is that each physical quality is dependent upon its predecessor or the optimal development of its predecessor. So let's take a, the, the best analogy I can make is let's take a hundred meter dash. I mean, you start out of the blocks, your ability to push out of the blocks from a standing start or a dead start is, is strength related. And then as you start to accelerate, you know, you're adding velocity to the strength and you become explosive. <clears throat> And then there's going to be a point in time in the race where you're upright and you're not, not, you're not applying, so to speak, mechanical concentric efforts into the ground, voluntary concentric efforts in the ground. You're actually rebounding from the ground and that's elastic abilities or I'll let you reacting to the ground or the elastic reactive strength or what we'll call plyometric. And then you hit top speed and then you finish the race. 
Well, if you look at the race in reverse, you can't hit an optimal top speed unless you have optimal elastic reactive abilities. And you can have optimal elastic reactive abilities unless you have optimal strength levels, explosive strength levels. And you can't be, have optimal power unless you have optimal strength levels. And so if you look at it in reverse, that's the hierarchy. And you can't repractice repetitively over time at maximum effort unless you have a good work capacity. So again, you know, so that's the hierarchy. What we've adapted in rehab is someone has surgery, right? They got to get off the crutches, get out of the sling. We restore range of motion. We, we have good um, um, uh, joint force couples, right? Because uh, corresponding ratios of joint contrib contribution and muscle con contribution to movement. And so we got to restore mobility and movement. And then sometimes muscles shut down, whether to tourniquet time, whatever it may be. So we got to get the muscles firing. So now when we have mobility and movement, we can assume the exercise position and the muscles are firing appropriately so that they contract and they can get a benefit of exercise performance. Then we establish work capacity and we go through the hierarchy. So that's how I, you know, so I use the hierarchy with regards to training athletes as well as it's adaptation and with regards to rehab and we and we've published us as you can see so yep and uh you know again whether we're dealing with um our patients with uh, specific injuries or you know athletes you know having this kind of stepwise uh, progression uh to things and making sure we have all these physical qualities because just like you said they're dependent on on one another as you're building up the pyramid so uh to just circle back to this overall talk on on returning back to sports and, and activities, you know, after you know, uh, you know this lockdown period, I think you know the big take home points here are related to you know appropriate progression, you know, making sure that you're ready to go back, uh, an appropriate <laughs> build up of the volume, yeah. um, not just get, jumping back out onto the field. So I think it's that, you know, progression and steady buildup of the volume is what's going to get our athletes and weekend warriors back safe. Well, you know, in this situation, it could also introduce high intensity, but at low volumes. And I am a believer that there's a point in time where there's enough volume, right? And then you just want to slide the scale to the right. You don't want to add more work. You want to increase the quality of the work that's necessary to perform. Right, so how much volume is enough? I mean, that's depending upon the situation you're placed in. I don't believe more is better. Um, the only other thing I'll add is, you know, in training athletes, you, you can work all the physical qualities simultaneously, right? It's just where you're placing emphasis on the biggest deficit. And in rehab, you may not have the time to go through all the physical qualities. So at minimum, whether it's through, um, you know, the insurance that the policy that the patient has, or, you know, they're in season and so they just want to get back to their game, you know, they got hurt and it just, as soon as they, they feel well enough and they're cleared, they're going to go back to play. So, you know, at minimum in rehab, I think we have to focus on, you know, the mobility, the movement, the muscle reeducation, work capacity and strength. And if you don't get to anything else, so be it. But those things are uh, are real important with a limitation in volume as well, because these people are, are not even quote unquote normal, whatever that means. And so they've got to definitely be taken through a progression. So not to induce an overuse injury or edema or inflammation or whatever it may be. Great. So I think this gives a, a nice uh, overview of, uh, you know, returning to sports and activity uh, post COVID. Uh, Rob, I just want to thank you for your time here, and we will talk soon. All right, Frank, thanks for having me. Have a great day, and stay safe. You take care.